On behalf of UKLFI Charitable Trust, I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar, marking the centenary of the adoption of the Mandate for Palestine by the Council of the League of Nations on the 24th of July, 1922. We are very honored that the President of the State of Israel has agreed to say a few words to us on this special occasion. Isaac Herzog, qualified as a lawyer and became a senior partner at leading Israeli law firm Herzog, Fox and Neiman. After serving as government secretary, he was elected to the Knesset as a member of the Labour Party and was a minister in several Israeli governments. He was elected chair of the Labour Party and became leader of the opposition in the Knesset. He was subsequently chair of the Jewish Agency before being elected by an overwhelming majority of the Knesset as the 11th president of the modern state of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency, President Isaac Herzog. Dear leaders, members and friends of the UK Lawyers for Israel, 100 years ago, the 51 members of the League of Nations unanimously approved the Mandate for Palestine whose preamble declared that, and I quote, recognition has been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. This declaration gives expression to the two undeniable pillars of Israel's legitimacy as a Jewish and democratic state, the ancient unbroken connection of the Jewish people to the land of Israel and binding international decisions, including the 1922 League of Nations mandate. Indeed, it was these twin pillars which my late grandfather, Rabbi Isaac Halevi Herzog, relied upon when he tore up the British white paper on the steps of Jerusalem Hufa Synagogue in 1939. It was these pillars which my late father, Chaim Herzog, then Israel's ambassador to the United Nations and later Israel's president, placed before the family of nations in rejecting the anti-Semitic Zionism is Racism Resolution in 1975. Unfortunately today, there are still those who seek to deny the legitimacy of Israel's existence, as well as the legal, historical, and national rights of the Jewish people. Such voices are heard in academia, online, and even in halls of power. As a former member of the Knesset, as chair of the Jewish Agency, which receives its name from the League of Nations mandate, and currently as the President of the State of Israel, I'm fully committed to the fight against all forms of delegitimization, anti-Zionism, and modern anti-Semitism, whatever their source. I want to congratulate and thank UK LFI for its tireless efforts to advocate for the rights of the Jewish people, educate regarding international law, and courageously standing up to anti-Israel discrimination and demonization. I wish you all a fruitful and productive webinar on this important topic, marking a historic milestone in the road to our independence as the nation state of the Jewish people. And may you all continue having great success in your endeavors and efforts. Toda Raba. Well, uh, we are extremely grateful to President Herzog for that clear and authoritative address. I'm also delighted that Professor Stephen Zipperstein has agreed to speak in this webinar. He will speak for about 35 minutes and will then address questions from the audience, which I will put to him. So please put your questions in the Q&A box, which you can open by clicking at the bottom of your screen and we will try to cover as many of these questions as possible. Steve Zipperstein has had three interesting careers in the law. First, as a US federal prosecutor, then as chief legal officer of Verizon Wireless and BlackBerry Limited, and now in academia. He is adjunct professor in the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA and a distinguished senior fellow at its Center for Middle East Development. He also lectures at Santa Barbara's Department of History and is a visiting professor at Tel Aviv University Law School. He has written two superb books about the legal history of the mandate, 
and I will put links to further details about these in the chat box. Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for that very kind introduction. We're all deeply honored by the words of President Herzog to introduce the webinar. Uh, I also would like to thank UKLFI Charitable Trust for inviting me to be with all of you today. And of course, I wanna thank all of you who have joined us as I put my slides up. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whether, wherever you might be. Uh, well, this Sunday, this coming Sunday, July 24, marks the 100th anniversary of the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. Uh, you see the cover here on the right is printed uh, by the uh, UK government later that year. But I'm going to begin by taking you back 107 years to 1915, to July of 1915. Uh, World War I was raging in Europe, Britain and France fighting Germany, also fighting the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, uh, which controlled large swaths of territory throughout the Middle East. And in July of 1915, almost exactly 107 years ago, the British government in London instructed its high commissioner or ambassador in Cairo, you see him here on the left, Sir Henry McMahon, to reach out to the leader of the Middle Eastern Arabs based in Mecca, the Sharif Hussein, you see him on the right, the great, great grandfather of the current King of Jordan, Abdullah II. And the UK government uh, ordered, instructed Sir Henry McMahon to begin a correspondence in July of 1915 with the Sharif Hussein of Mecca, the purpose of which was quite simple. Uh, Britain wanted to encourage the Middle Eastern Arabs to rise up to revolt against Turkey and to join forces with Britain to switch sides and join forces with Britain against Turkey. And in the correspondence, which began in July of 1915 and lasted until February, March of 1916, uh, the Sharif said to Sir Henry McMahon, look, we will be uh, interested in rising up against Turkey on the condition that you promise that when the war is over, that we Arabs will have our independence in all of the Turkish areas in the Middle East. Turkey, of course, had occupied the Middle East uh, since 1517. Uh, so this is now 400 years later. And the key letter in this chain of correspondence between McMahon and Hussein occurred on October 24, 1915. A letter from McMahon to Hussein uh, in Arabic. Uh, and you see on the right side, the map of the Ottoman administrative districts for the portion of the Middle East that we now call uh, Syria and Jordan and Israel and the West Bank and Gaza. But note that there is no such place called Palestine on this map. The Vilayet of Beirut was the Turkish area that encompassed uh, northern, uh, northwestern Syria, Lebanon, and uh, northern, uh, the northern part of the modern state of Israel. The independent Sanjak of Jerusalem encompassing Jerusalem itself and the a southern area of the modern state of Israel. And in this letter of October 24, 1915, McMahon pledged to Hussein that yes, when the war is over, we, the United Kingdom, uh, will do our best to see that the Arabs obtain independence, except, except this pledge um, only covers areas where Britain is free to act without detriment to, to the interests of our ally France. And of course, France had interests in Lebanon and in Jerusalem. And then secondly, the letter said that certain portions of Syria lying to the west of the districts of Damascus, Homs, Hama, and Aleppo, four towns in Syria that you see there on the map, those areas lying to the west cannot be said to be purely Arab and are excluded from the pledge. And for the next 107 years until today, the meaning of this language has been debated and disputed and litigated. The Arabs claiming that this language did not exclude Palestine. In other words, Palestine should have been included in the areas guaranteed for Arab independence after the war. And the Jewish side and the British side both arguing the opposite, that in fact, Palestine was exempted or excluded from the pledge. Well, a few months later, 
Britain and France secretly carved up the Middle East between them uh, without any reference whatsoever to the McMahon pledge to Hussein, uh, France claiming the area marked A as its area of influence and the blue above it as its area of control, Britain claiming the area marked in B for its area of influence and the pink to the right as its area of control. Uh, and of course, you see to the left in yellow uh, portions of uh, southern Lebanon, uh, central and northern Israel, and even portions of Jordan that were designated as an international zone that would uh, be named Palestine. And not long after that, in November of 1917, uh, as General Allenby was marching northward uh, to Beersheba and eventually to uh, Jerusalem in December of 1917, uh, Britain issued the famous Balfour Declaration. You see there on the left a photograph of Foreign Secretary Balfour uh, writing in this letter, November 2, 1917, uh, to Lord Lionel Rothschild, the famous 67-word pledge from the British government, this time uh, to the Jews. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Now, this document was made public. It was widely reported at the time. And what was the reaction from the Sharif Hussein of Mecca? And here you see his son on the right, Prince Faisal, a photograph together with the Zionist leader Chaim Weizmann on the left. Well, originally the reaction from the Sharif and from Faisal to the Balfour Declaration was favorable. In fact, in early 1919, uh, Faisal and Weizmann signed this agreement. And you see the last page of it here, Weizmann's signature in the lower left, uh, the uh, Prince Faisal's uh, signature and a written addendum to the agreement in Arabic immediately above and to the right, uh, Prince Faisal's addendum translated into English by uh, Colonel Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. And essentially this agreement provided that Faisal would support the Balfour Declaration and Zionist uh, objectives in Palestine to create a national home for the Jewish people on condition, as Faisal says in his addendum, that Britain would make good on the remaining promises of independence that McMahon had made to his father, Hussein, a few years earlier. And Faisal reiterated his support for Zionist objectives in two letters in March of 1919 to a future US Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter expressing sympathy with Zionism. And the second letter uh, to Sir Herbert Samuel, uh, very important figure, Jewish figure in the UK, we'll hear more about him in a second, uh, expressing perfect accord between his view and the view of Chaim Weizmann. In the meantime, the Treaty of Versailles was negotiated in 1919. It became effective in early 1920. And the first portion of the Treaty of Versailles is the Covenant of the League of Nations. The League of Nations formed in the aftermath of World War I, the war to end all wars. The objective of the League of Nations was to secure world peace and also uh, to implement a relatively new concept, a revolutionary concept in international law, namely that uh, the acquisition of territory by force was no longer recognized as valid. And instead, um, as you see in Article 22, uh, the victorious powers who captured territory from Germany around the world, various colonies, and from Turkey in the Middle East, that the victorious powers would hold those territories in trust or under a mandate from the League of Nations until such time as the local communities in those countries were ready to uh, be recognized as independent countries and take control of their own destiny. Now, the victorious powers, after signing the Treaty of Versailles, gathered in a conference in San Remo, Italy, in April of 1920. Uh, note, by the way, the presence of a Japanese delegate on the far right of the picture. Japan was an ally of Britain uh, and uh, France in World War I, uh, and so was Italy, of course. Uh, and at San Remo, the victorious powers 
decided upon a system of mandates or trusteeships uh, divided up primarily between Britain and France to administer the territories that had been captured from Turkey in the Middle East. And so on the 25th of April, 1920, the accords were made public at San Remo, uh, Syria and Iraq provisionally recognized as independent states. But what about Palestine? What about Palestine? The parties agreed at San Remo that the mandatory, which was to become Great Britain, would be responsible for putting into effect the Balfour Declaration, originally made by Britain. The date in the San Remo Accord is incorrect. It's November 2nd, not November 8th, but we will forgive them for that because they note that the Balfour Declaration was also adopted by the other allied powers. Uh, President Wilson approved it on behalf of the United States. Uh, Italy and Japan, France all adopted it in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. And when they talked about Palestine at the San Remo conference, this is what they were referring to, not just the modern day state of Israel, the West Bank and Gaza, but as well, the entire modern day state of Jordan. All of Jordan and modern Israel, West Bank were all considered as Palestine. And that was the area that was allocated to Britain. Well. The next day, the Times of London reported uh, the very joyous reaction uh, by the Jews and the Zionists who were very, very happy that uh, the mandate was going to be uh, uh, allocated to Britain. Uh, they were quite happy about that. And very interestingly, a Zionist spokesman said, the event will be celebrated in all Jewish centers with great joy. And the date, April 24, 1920, will perhaps become a Jewish national holiday. Well, it didn't. Many people have forgotten about what occurred at San Remo, but it actually was quite important because it laid the foundation for the eventual adoption in the mandate issued by the League of Nations of the very same principles. Just a few months after San Remo, the British government sent Sir Herbert Samuel, whose photograph we saw earlier, uh, to serve as the first British High Commissioner or Ambassador to Palestine. Uh, here you see uh, High Commissioner Samuel arriving there in early July 1920, 102 years ago, and reading a proclamation to those gathered at Government House um, on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. Uh, and at the same time, King George V issued this proclamation to the people of Palestine. And I want to thank one of our attendees, Hugh Kitson for bringing this to our attention. Uh, this proclamation from the king, noting um, that the uh, allied and associated powers have decided that measures shall be adopted to secure the gradual establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. And, and then very importantly, at the end of the proclamation, the king says, I shall watch with deep interest and warm sympathy, the future progress and development of a state very, very crucial and important that the King of England uh, noted here in this proclamation that they were talking about statehood in Palestine for the Jewish people. Here on the left in Hebrew, you see the word Medina, the mem is cut off a little bit, same story uh, in Arabic. And this concept that the purpose of the Balfour Declaration was to lead to Jewish statehood was actually reiterated and corroborated by Winston Churchill, uh, who served in the British government at the time of the Balfour Declaration, served as colonial secretary in 1921 and 1922, and in secret testimony, in camera testimony to the Palestine Royal Commission, otherwise known as the Peel Commission in March of 1937, look what Churchill said in his secret testimony. In the Balfour Declaration, we, the British government, certainly committed ourselves to the idea that someday, somehow, far in the future, subject to justice and economic convenience, there might well be a great Jewish state there, meaning in Palestine, numbered by millions. Uh, and he goes on to say, with justice and fair consideration to those displaced, certainly it was contemplated and intended that they, the Jews, might in the course of time become an overwhelmingly Jewish state. So that was Churchill in 1937. 
But let me rewind now back to 1922 when Churchill was serving as colonial secretary. By this time, Prince Faisal, who had designs on uh, becoming king of Syria, but was ejected from Syria by the French, by this time, Prince Faisal had changed his position, no longer sympathetic to the Balfour Declaration, no longer sympathetic to Zionism, and insisting that Palestine, in fact, was included in that pledge I showed you in the October 24, 1915 letter from Sir Henry McMahon to the Prince's father, the Sharif Hussein of Mecca. But Churchill, on behalf of the British government in this white paper that you see on the left in 1922, rejected the Arab claim that McMahon intended to include Palestine in the pledge, saying it's always been regarded by the British government that the pledge um, excluded the Vilayet of Beirut, excluded the independent Sanjak of Jerusalem, and therefore all of Palestine west of the Jordan River was excluded from McMahon's pledge to Hussein and reiterating that the Jews are in Palestine as of right and not on sufferance. And so this brings us to the 24th of July, 1922, the members of the Council of the League of Nations on behalf of the entire international community issued this document, the Mandate for Palestine, ratifying it unanimously in, in their meeting ordinarily in Geneva, this time at St. James's Palace uh, in London. And so now let me take just a couple of minutes to highlight some of the most important provisions of that document, that document which became by virtue of its ratification by the Council of the League of Nations, part of international law. And let me begin with the preamble, a noting that the mandatory, namely Great Britain, should be responsible for putting into effect the Balfour Declaration, the declaration originally made on November 2nd, 1917 by the British government. And so not only did San Remo, the San Remo Accords incorporate the Balfour Declaration, but now the mandate itself, ratified by the Council of the League of Nations, incorporating as a matter of international law, the Balfour Declaration in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. And even more important in the preamble, the language that President Herzog referred to uh, just as we began today, quote, whereas recognition, has thereby been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine, and this is the really key language, and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. Reconstituting, not constituting, not colonizing, but reconstituting. In other words, coming back to that which was their ancient homeland and reconstituting that homeland. Just a footnote here, Chaim Weizmann lobbied extensively to try to have the word reconstitute used in the Balfour Declaration. The British government refused to use that word. And now in 1922, Weizmann finally succeeded convincing the League of Nations to incorporate this concept of reconstitution in the preamble to the mandate. Article two requires Britain shall, Britain shall be responsible for placing the country under such political, administrative, and economic conditions as will secure the establishment of the Jew, excuse me, the Jewish national home. Article four, as you heard President Herzog say, recognizing uh, a Jewish agency uh, to work together with Britain to um, secure the establishment of the Jewish uh, national home. And what is significant about Article two and Article four is that these rights were allocated to the Jews, not just the Jews in Palestine, but to Jews throughout the world. But there is no parallel right in the mandate allocated to the local non-Jewish population. What is allocated to the local non-Jewish population uh, is the language here in Article six, that their rights and position shall not be prejudiced, but there is no political status or statehood or national home allocated to the non-Jewish population in Palestine. And meantime, the administration, the British administration of Palestine shall facilitate 
Jewish immigration, meaning Jews from all over the world can come there under suitable conditions, and the British government shall encourage, in cooperation with the Jewish agency, close settlement by Jews on the land. Again, no parallel provisions there for the local, no, excuse me, non-Jewish population. And so uh, I've summarized here on this slide the relative allocation of rights to Jews and Arabs conferred under international law by the Council of the League of Nations. The Jews received the rights to a national home and statehood, arguably, we'll come to that more in a minute, the Arabs did not receive any parallel rights. Civil and religious rights granted to both segments of the population, political representation, Jewish agency on the Jewish side, no uh, similar representation granted by the mandate. Of course, the Arabs did organize themselves, were represented by the Arab Higher Committee, led by the um, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajamin al Husseini, but that was not pursuant to uh, recognition by the world community through the mandate. Immigration rights and, and land acquisition, land settlement granted to the Jews, but not to the, the non Jewish population. The rights and position of non Jews protected, as I said. The mandate makes very clear in Article 13 that purely Muslim sacred shrines shall be controlled solely and exclusively by the Muslims. Zero rights for the Jews, in fact, no interference by Britain either. And then both communities granted rights to free exercise of worship and rights to be free from discrimination. One final provision that is extremely important in the mandate was Article 25, which essentially gave uh, Britain the authority to partition Palestine, remember Palestine was all of modern Israel and Jordan, to partition Palestine into two sections. To the east of the Jordan River, so-called Transjordan, would be severed, and uh, a separate emirate uh, would be created there under the leadership of another son of the Sharif Hussein of Mecca, Abdullah, Abdullah, the great grandfather of the current King of Jordan. And eventually the Emirate of Transjordan became independent in 1946 and eventually uh, adopted the name Jordan. On the west side of the Jordan River was the remaining portion of Palestine that Britain administered uh, until 1948. Let me bring you now forward to 1937. I mentioned the Palestine Royal Commission, the Peel Commission, where Churchill testified in secret uh, that it was the objective of the Balfour Declaration to grant statehood to the Jews in Palestine. Uh, and at the end of their very, very lengthy report that you see on the left, the Royal Commission concluded that the fairest outcome for the Jews and Arabs in Palestine would be the two-state solution. This was the original version of the two-state solution proposed in July of 1937, the orange for the Jews, the purple for the Arabs. Britain would retain the land corridor from Jaffa to Jerusalem and Bethlehem in green. Um, the Jews and Chaim Weizmann were not <clears throat> thrilled about the small amount of territory allocated to them, but they decided eventually to accept this proposal. The Arab side that led by the Mufti rejected it. Eventually, in late 1938, the British government abandoned the proposal as unworkable. Uh, and in May of 1939, Britain issued the infamous white paper. President Herzog uh, uh, indicated that uh, his grandfather tore up the white paper at the Churva Synagogue in uh, Jerusalem. The white paper adopted the one state solution, abandoning the two state solution of the Peel Commission, uh, noting that in 10 years, the majority population in Palestine would rule the entirety of the country. Uh, Britain locked in a two to one Arab majority uh, by severely limiting Jewish immigration from Europe, trapping millions and millions of Jews in Europe uh, to the uh, designs of the Holocaust. Six million Jews perished as a result of the white paper and other, uh, of course, the, the, the Nazi final solution. Jewish land acquisition was almost entirely banned by the white paper as well. And when the war ended in early uh, 1946, the British and American governments joined forces to send a, a judicial a commission to uh, Palestine uh, to conduct a trial, at the end of which the Anglo-American Committee 
uh, ruled unanimously, including all six British members, that the white paper of 1939 was unlawful. But at the same time, the committee recommended the no state solution for Palestine, not two states, not one state, but that Palestine would continue under British trusteeship or American trusteeship. No one really liked that idea at all. And so in early 1947, Britain decided to hand over the Palestine issue to the United Nations, which convened a special committee and then an ad hoc committee. Uh, and in, in uh, the fall of 1947, recommending again, as the Palestine Royal Commission had done uh, some 10 years earlier, recommending again, the two-state solution for Palestine, a Jewish state uh, and an Arab state. Uh, and here you see the map on the right as recommended by the United Nations and adopted by the General Assembly there on the left at their original headquarters in Lake Success on Long Island, recommending the Jewish state in the orange, the Arab state in the yellow. You see Jerusalem and Bethlehem there in white. That was to be treated as an international zone or a corpus separatum, a separate body. Again, the Mufti rejected the plan, launching a civil war uh, immediately, uh, despite the fact that the United Nations, speaking on behalf of the world community, uh, recommended uh, the two-state solution. Note here on the lower right of the New York Times front page, the reference to a commission being appointed, a Palestine commission, to implement the two-state solution. But not long after, in February of 1948, the Palestine Commission wrote to the UN Security Council, and look at what they say, quote, powerful Arab interests, both inside and outside Palestine, are defying the resolution of the General Assembly and are engaged in a deliberate effort to alter by force the settlement envisaged therein. Very different kind of language from the United Nations in 1948 than we are used to seeing today. In the afternoon of May 14, 1948, the British government finally decided it had had enough. It issued this document from the colonial and foreign offices on the left announcing to the world that it was terminating the Palestine mandate unilaterally, lowering the Union Jack for the last time, uh, and the mandate would be terminated effective at the stroke of midnight at the end of May 14, beginning of May 15. Uh, and later in the day on May 14, on the right, David Ben-Gurion uh, gathering uh, the leadership of the Zionist movement at the Art Museum on Rothschild Boulevard in Tel Aviv, now, now known as Independence Hall, standing under the portrait of Theodore Herzl, announcing the Israeli Declaration of Independence, the birth of the new state. Uh, the United States recognized it provisionally within 10 minutes. Uh, the reaction from the surrounding Arab countries was to join the Mufti and launch an all-out war on the new state. Egypt bombed Tel Aviv uh, the next morning on May 15, uh, and the armies of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia joined Egypt in the invasion of the new state. Uh, the fighting, as you know, ended in uh, early 1949. Armistice agreements were signed, uh, and on the 11th of May, 1949, the United Nations voted to extend an offer of membership to the new state of Israel. There you see on the left, then UN Ambassador Abba Eben, and on the right, then Israeli Foreign Minister, future Prime Minister Moshe Sharet. And so just to kind of show you these maps once again, the Royal Commission's two-state solution on the left, uh, immediately next to it, the UN two-state solution, Resolution 181, November 29, 1947. The next map shows uh, the uh, area of the state of Israel as of the armistice agreements with Jordan and Egypt in 1949. And then on the right, the more modern day map of the state of Israel. And so I wanna wrap up in the next couple of minutes by just reviewing what I consider based on my research and my study to be some of the very important legal consequences stemming uh, from the British mandate for Palestine and the other events that we talked about. Um, and I want to preface this by saying that my own personal view, my own personal view, is that the two-state solution probably represents the fairest outcome, but I do not believe, I do not believe that the Palestinians have a strong legal case for statehood. 
uh, statehood for the Palestinians must be the result of negotiation with Israel, not litigation. So I begin by noting that the United Nations Charter in Article 80 provides that although the British government terminated the mandate at the end of the day on May 14, 1948, that termination did not in any way, shape, or form extinguish the rights of the Jewish people uh, nor the international community's obligations, and there's that word again, to reconstitute the Jewish national home uh, in Palestine. When the Mufti and the Palestinian Arabs rejected and renounced the Peel Commission's two-state solution in, 19, in 1937, the White Paper's one-state solution in 1939, and again, the UN's two-state solution in 1947, those rejections and renunciations left a gap in sovereignty over the West Bank and Gaza, and I'll talk about that more in a second. When Jordan and Egypt uh, attacked the new state of Israel when they launched war in 1948, that did not in any way, shape, or form as a matter of law confer sovereignty on either Jordan over the West Bank or Egypt over Gaza. Um, in fact, when Jordan purported to annex the West Bank in 1950, only two countries, Britain and Pakistan, recognized that. Uh, the armistice agreements that uh, Israel negotiated with Jordan and Egypt in 1949 contain language expressly preserving Israeli claims to the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem for future negotiation. And as I said earlier, when the UN formally recognized the state of Israel and uh, extended membership status to Israel on the 11th of May, 1949, that act completed the legal steps toward Jewish statehood uh, in a portion of Palestine, the state of Israel, that began, that process that began with the Balfour Declaration and the mandate. Now, I mentioned the Palestinian Arab repeated rejections and renunciations of the two state and one state solutions. And as a matter of law, as a matter of law, my view is that those repeated renunciations and rejections constituted implicit legal waivers of sovereignty over the West Bank and Gaza. Those implicit waivers were made explicit at the Jericho Conference in 1950, when a large number of Palestinian notables, civil society leaders uh, gathered in Jericho, pledged their loyalty to King Abdullah I of Jordan and expressly waived sovereignty over the West Bank in favor of the King of Jordan. And that express waiver was reaffirmed once again explicitly in the original PLO Charter of May 1964, Article 24, saying the PLO, quote, the Palestine Liberation Organization, quote, does not exercise any regional sovereignty over the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. And I wanted to show you a, a document. This is a confidential a dispatch from the British Embassy in Amman, Jordan, February 26, 1964, just a few months before the original PLO charter was issued by the founder of the PLO, Ahmed Shukeri, who you see there on the left, he was Arafat's predecessor. And this is a very interesting and very important document. Um, the British ambassador reporting to London that Shukeri's first statement on arriving in Amman was that there was no question of creating a Palestine Republic as this would be meaningless, nor was there any intention of attempting to establish a form of Palestinian territorial sovereignty. Um, going on to say, and near the bottom here, Shukeri added that the creation of a Palestine government was not desirable as it would not serve the Palestine cause. Uh, in the Oslo Agreements, the second Oslo Agreement in 1995, uh, the PLO agreed, uh, as Egypt and Jordan had agreed in the 1949 Armistice Agreements, that Israel continued to preserve Israeli claims to the West Bank, Jerusalem, and Gaza, pending final status negotiations. But despite all of this history, Palestinian lawyers and scholars today claim a legal a legal right to sovereignty over the West Bank and Gaza. But my view is that the Palestinian repeated express and implied waivers to sovereignty over those areas severely undermine 
their legal claim today. I think the better view is that the legal status of the West Bank and Gaza today remain unresolved. Sovereignty has been in abeyance ever since Turkey was ousted by Great Britain at the end of World War I. The League of Nations issued a mandate to Britain. Britain terminated the mandate in May of 1948. The State of Israel was founded. There was a war. Jordan occupied the West Bank from 1949 until 1967. Egypt occupied Gaza from 1949 until 1967. Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005. Israel, of course, still occupying the West Bank. Sovereignty has never conclusively been established over either the West Bank or Gaza. And therefore, as I say at the bottom here, and as I said earlier, this conflict can only be settled through politics, diplomacy, and statecraft, not through litigation. I end with the same slide that I began with. I want to thank you all very, very much for your attention. I sincerely appreciate your being here uh, for this presentation. And now I would love to hear your questions and comments. Thank you so, so much. Um. I'm hoping um, um, my uh, colleague will switch on the video because I can't at the moment. Um, uh, but um, uh, thank you very much, Steve, for that uh, superb presentation. Um, we now have the uh, uh, question and answer session. And thank you very much indeed for being willing to uh, answer um, our questions. Um, if you've not uh, done so already, um, uh, members of the audience, please put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, now, um, a couple of the questions um, have um, uh, effectively said, well, um, the League of Nations mandate was 100 years ago when uh, Western powers ruled the, uh, the world. And um, why should we treat it as having any validity today. Um, so I'd like to um, put that to you, bearing in mind also the uh, context of the other arrangements uh, that were made um, in relation to the uh, other territories in the Middle East that were liberated from the Turkish Empire um, at this time. Sure, that's a wonderful question. Um, and I would begin by noting that there is controversy as to whether or not the mandate formally or officially or in some way, shape or form continues to exist today as a matter of law, as a matter of international law, notwithstanding the British termination of that mandate in May of 1948, notwithstanding um, the United Nations actually according recognition to and accepting Israel as a member state uh, in May of 1949. And so I think that the, probably the most likely answer is that the mandate no longer exists. I mean, it's very interesting because there are some brilliant Palestinian lawyers and scholars who do take the position that the mandate still exists and that the Palestinians have rights under the mandate. Um, at the same time, there were uh, Palestinian witnesses who testified under oath uh, in various British trials in the 1920s and 1930s who argued that the mandate was null and void because it conflicted with Sir Henry McMahon's pledge in that October 24, 1915 letter to the Sharif Hussein of Mecca promising all of Palestine, according to the Arab argument, um, to the Arabs for independence and therefore under Article 20 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, which abrogated all prior and consistent uh, understandings inter se, meaning between countries, that somehow or another the mandate was void. And so we've seen somewhat of an inconsistency in the Arab legal position on the mandate. I think the better argument is that the mandate no longer exists, but certainly the United Nations in Article 80 undertook to complete the obligations that the League of Nations uh, accepted on behalf of the world community to the Jewish people in the Palestine mandate to reconstitute the Jewish national home in Palestine. And that's different. That's different from the other so-called class A mandates that the League of Nations awarded uh, to France uh, for Syria, to Britain for Iraq uh, after World War I, where there was no question whatsoever about any other interests other than the interests of a local uh, Arab population provisionally recognized as independent to be able at some point uh, to stand on their own 
uh, and fulfill the dream of self-determination. And so those mandates for uh, Iraq slash Mesopotamia and Syria, very, very, very different from the Palestine mandate. And that's clear uh, from Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations and from the language of the mandate itself. Oh, well, thank you for, for, for that. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps just to add, add, of course, the other mandates um, uh, conferred uh, um, uh, national rights, uh, uh, which became uh, Arab states uh, across the vast majority of uh, the territory uh, that had been uh, the Middle Eastern Empire of the, uh, of the Turks. Um, which um, uh, I, I think uh, some people would say is a, a major factor to consider when you uh, look at the um, uh, Palestine mandate. Um, uh, and um, uh, picking up um, your answer to that last question, uh, what, one of the questions uh, we have is, uh, well, why does um, Israel not uh, um, uh, make up more out of the fact that um, uh, the uh, uh, Palestine mandate um, uh, uh, contemplated the Jewish national home in the territory um, west of the Jordan River um, to the Mediterranean Sea. Why, why does uh, Israel not invoke these rights that you uh, of the Jewish people that you mention? So <clears throat> that's a great question, and and the I think the best answer <clears throat> is that there is ambiguity in the Balfour Declaration. Um, the phrase or the words in Palestine are not, not crystal clear in part of Palestine, in all of Palestine. And remember the San Remo Accords carried forward, incorporated that same language as did the mandate itself, as did the mandate itself, um, secure the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. What does that mean? What does that mean? Um, and so <clears throat> that's, this is why I say, that sovereignty over certain portions of Palestine west of the Jordan River, namely the West Bank, uh, has not been conclusively uh, established as a matter of international law, even as we sit here today. Um, the Palestinians, I believe, do not have a solid case, a legal case uh, for sovereignty over the West Bank as we sit here right now. They simply don't. Um, the state of Israel does not have a rock solid case to sovereignty over the West Bank either. Of course, Israel captured the West Bank in a defensive war in 1967, as well as East Jerusalem. Uh, Israeli law has extended Israeli sovereignty uh, to uh, East Jerusalem and the Old City, but not throughout the West Bank. Um, and the Israeli position at Oslo was that uh, the status of the West Bank should be subject to future negotiations. The Palestine Liberation Organization, for its part in Oslo, and I think this is very important, accepted, accepted no sovereignty in Area C, accepted shared administration over Area B, and accepted a form of autonomy in the major Palestinian towns in Area A. That is something that falls far short of supporting a legal claim to sovereignty throughout the West Bank. So I think the best answer is that sovereignty continues in abeyance uh, in both the West Bank and in Gaza pending final status negotiations. Um, so picking up uh, your conclusion that um, the conflict can only be settled through politics and diplomacy and, and not litigation, can, can I ask you this, is it helpful or unhelpful to refer to international law um, in um, negotiations in, in the politics? Um, when I was trained as a mediator of commercial disputes, it was emphasized that it's generally unhelpful to refer to the legal position and that it's better to focus on practical solutions that work for both parties or all parties in a multi-party dispute. W would you say that advice applies to this conflict or is there a role for international law in um, discussing in, in the diplomacy and in the negotiations? So I couldn't agree more. I think that that the conflict must be resolved through statecraft and negotiation, not litigation, as I've said. What is very ironic here is that uh, both sides from the onset of the conflict, going back over 100 years, even uh, uh, while uh, the Ottoman Sultan was still ostensibly the ruler of the area, both sides um, would frequently resort to litigation, to legal petitions, 
originally petitions filed with the Sultan uh, in Constantinople, Istanbul. Um, and then after uh, uh, World War I, uh, both sides frequently, frequently would send uh, legal petitions, not just to the British government, but to the Permanent Mandates Commission of the League of Nations, Britain's uh, overseer or supervisor, uh, with respect to the implementation uh, of the mandate. As I mentioned, and I've written two books about this, there were multiple trials, trials with lawyers and witnesses and testimony and cross-examination, pitting Arabs against Jews uh, during the 1920s uh, and 1930s. And to me, uh, what is so ironic about all of this, uh, and this of course is carried forward into the modern era, the Palestinians have made incredibly effective use of the law at the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. What is so ironic to me is that this is not inherently a legal problem. This is a political problem. This is a problem of uh, two people claiming rights in the same uh, area of land, um, neither of whom has a rock solid claim to the West Bank. Israel, I would argue, has an absolutely rock solid claim uh, to the state of Israel uh, by virtue of not just the mandate, but the UN uh, recognition of statehood uh, in May 1949. The issue is the West Bank. Who owns the West Bank? Who owns it? Who owns it? And that has to be resolved through statecraft and diplomacy, through practical solutions. The only time that I can think of in the entire history of the conflict when a legal proceeding led for at least a short number of years, 15, 16 years, to relative calm was the Lofgren Commission in 1930, which held a month-long trial in Jerusalem to adjudicate the competing rights and claims of the Jews and the Muslims to the um, to the Wailing Wall, the Barak, as the Muslims called it, al Barak, and the pavement in front of the of the hotel, um, and there the verdict from the three judges, um, one from Holland, one from Sweden, one from Switzerland, um, was essentially that the rights of the parties would uh, follow the pre-existing practices under the status quo that existed during Turkish rule, which meant that the Jews had some right above and beyond mere tourists to come and make their devotions at the Kotel, the surviving remnant of the temples, um, but that the legal owner of the Kotel and the pavement was the, or the Kotel rather, was the waqf, the, the Muslim waqf, um, and that the pavement was not itself a holy to uh, the Muslim religion. Now, of course, uh, following 1967, this is no longer the legal status of the uh, pavement or the Kotel, but uh, that verdict, which satisfied nobody, nobody liked the outcome, not the Muslims and not the Jews, did bring a measure of calm uh, to the uh, area of the Kotel for the period between 1930 and 1947, 48. There weren't any other violent incidents during those years as there had been uh, in the prior decade in the 1920s on multiple occasions. That aside though, that aside, this conflict requires creativity and statecraft and not litigation to resolve it. And picking up um, your reference to the various trials um, during the period of the mandate and the various inquiries uh, that were held, a couple of questions ask um, um, that point out that British policy towards Palestine fluctuated greatly during the period and um, ask, well, what were the main um, internal factors uh, leading to this? Uh, and in particular, it's asked, well, what accounted for the radical about face that took place uh, between uh, the Appeal Commission um, in 1937 and um, uh, the decision uh, not to implement it um, in uh, 1938 or 1939? So, as I mentioned, during World War I, um, Britain uh, was successful in persuading the Sharif Hussein uh, and the Arab side to rise up against Turkey and switch sides and join forces with Britain. As we come to 1938, um, about a year after the Royal Commission proposed the two-state solution, as we come into 1938, of course, September 30, uh, Neville Chamberlain flew to Munich, uh, signed the infamous accord with Hitler, sacrificing the um, uh, the Sudeten uh, uh, population in Western Czechoslovakia to the Nazis. Uh, landing in London, waving the paper, declaring there will be peace in our time. And within a couple of months, 
it was clear to the British government that that uh, piece of paper was worthless, that war with Germany was inevitable. And Britain, which had persuaded the Arabs to join them in World War I, was now concerned deeply that Germany might persuade not just the Arabs in the Middle East, but the Muslim population in India to rise up against Britain as World War II was looming. And so there are secret meetings of the British cabinet occurring in late 1938, uh, where uh, both Foreign Secretary Halifax and Colonial Secretary Malcolm MacDonald um, are discussing the vital need of Britain to make sure that Hitler was not able to flip uh, the Arabs in the Middle East and the Muslims in India to the German side and to keep them on the British side. And therefore, therefore, uh, in late 1938, the cabinet decided secretly that uh, if the Jews and the Arabs could not come to terms and agree on a resolution for their dispute in Palestine, and keep in mind the Arab revolt had begun in 1936 and was still raging in late 1938, if the Jews and Arabs couldn't come to an agreement, then Britain would impose a solution unilaterally on both sides. And so Britain bought, brought the parties, Jews and Arabs, to London in February of 1939 for uh, a month-long uh, series of discussions. Those did not produce agreement between, those discussions did not produce agreement between the Jews and the Arabs. The conference collapsed in mid-March 1939, and Britain issued the white paper uh, two months later, May 17, 1939. I actually found in the files of the British archives uh, Malcolm McDonald's handwritten first draft of the white paper. He wrote it himself on his letterhead at his country estate uh, at Hyde Hall. And it was clear from the, from the beginning here that British policy toward the Jews um, uh, changed dramatically. Britain effectively sacrificed Zionism. Britain abrogated its responsibilities under the mandate to facilitate Jewish immigration and land acquisition. Uh, by uh, by uh, clamping down on uh, Jewish immigration, all but slamming shut the doors, allowing only a grand total of 75,000 more Jews uh, to leave Europe for Palestine between 1939 uh, and 1944. By the end of the war, by the way, fewer than 75,000 had been able to make the trip and condemning millions and millions of Jews uh, to slaughter at the hands of Hitler. The white paper, the most uh, infamous, and I would say, uh, vicious and inhumane document ever issued by um, the British government. And I say that uh, with great sadness. Uh, now, some of the questions have picked up on uh, your comments that um, uh, Palestinians or representatives of Palestinians waived rights by their various uh, actions. Um, so one question asked, why did the PLO not support a Palestinian state on the West Bank in 1964? Um, you touched on that, but I don't know whether you uh, uh, want to enlarge on it. Uh, and um, um, also it's asked, well, uh, well, why don't the legally binding principles of acquired rights and estoppel impact on the current legal situation, or, or, or do they? Um, yeah. Um so uh, with respect to the PLO in 1964, and it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Now, people forget that the West Bank was under Jordanian occupation for 18 years from 1949 to 1967. I, I'm writing a book about that. I call it the forgotten occupation. And uh, the only thing that changed in 1967 was that Israel replaced Jordan as the occupant, but the status was the same under occupation from 1949 until uh, today and previously, of course, under uh, British rule uh, and before that under Turkish rule. So in 1964, and you saw a little bit of it from the document that I showed you from the British ambassador in, in Amman, uh, Shukeri, um clearly taking great care uh, not to get crossways, not to offend King Hussein, and uh, not to uh, stir up a West Bank revolution against the king. During the period 1949 to 1967, uh, Palestinian Arabs in the West Bank held Jordanian passports. The Jordanian dinar was the currency. Uh, they could move freely from one side um, across the river to the other. Uh, they were they stood for election to the Jordanian parliament. Um, as I say, only two countries, Britain and Pakistan, recognized Jordan's uh, annexation, purported annexation 
of the West Bank. But what I think the better question is, you know, why was why did Palestinian nationalism in the West Bank, why was it dormant during 1949 to 1967? The United Nations not once, not once during 1949 to 1967 ever, ever convened for the purpose of promoting Palestinian statehood in the West Bank and Gaza, not once. So why did all of this change simply because Israel replaced Jordan as the occupant? Well, I think the answer is probably pretty obvious. Um, and in terms of the estoppel question, that's a great question. That's a great question. Ordinarily in the law, um, waiver and estoppel are two concepts that go together. If one party waives a right and the other party acts to its detriment in reliance on that waiver, then the party who waived is deemed to be estopped. In other words, permanently banned from reasserting that right. It is questionable, I think fair to say, whether or not Israel can prove definitively that it relied to its detriment on Palestinian waivers of offers of statehood uh, in the West Bank uh, over the years. I think that that is a debatable point. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sitting here arguing that the Palestinians are permanently banned, permanently barred from changing their position. And indeed they have changed their position and they now want statehood in the West Bank. All I'm saying is that the waivers weaken their legal claim, their legal case substantially, and therefore they should pursue statecraft, diplomacy, and negotiation. As I've said, the Palestinians have brilliantly reframed the conflict into a legal conflict, one involving um, victimhood and deprivation of rights and injustice and so forth. And um, there, I think, um, great job of reframing, brilliant job of invoking a narrative of, uh, uh, of, of, of legal rights that have been taken away but in fact, on close examination, this case, this situation is not a legal a matter whatsoever. It ought to be resolved through negotiation. Well, look, looking forward, um, can I pair a couple of questions, uh, yeah. which in a sense um, um, oppose each other or present alternative points of view? Well, one question is, well, uh, the Arabs have rejected um, uh, solutions um, many times, as uh, you've um, pointed out. Um, what reason is there to believe that um, uh, they might um, accept a, um, a solution now? Um, but um, uh, another question is, well, you, you mentioned the initial approval of Zionism by Arab leaders a century ago, and the hopes everyone had for mutually beneficial cooperation back then. In between, there's been much hostility, but do you think the wheel has now turned full circle, or at any rate, has turned some of the circle? Um, based on uh, your examination of the history, do you think that the progress um, uh, in the um, Abraham Accords will be maintained, um, or uh, is it more likely that that won't last? Well, um, great point about the Abraham Accords. Obviously, it's been a, a really significant an important development to see the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, um, Morocco and Sudan normalizing relations with Israel. Uh, the chief of staff of the Israeli army, uh, I think is still in Morocco, made a trip there. Uh, Israel and Morocco have uh, not just engaged in uh, robust commercial exchanges, but um, defense exchanges as well. And of course, um, during um, the last half of 2020, following the signing of the Abraham Accords, uh, more than 200,000 Israelis traveled to uh, Dubai. Uh, Emirates airline uh, announced the start of a daily uh, Boeing 777 wide body flights from Tel Aviv to Dubai and back up until now. It's been a smaller uh, Emirati carrier that's been flying three times a day on the Tel Aviv route. This is all wonderful. It's fantastic. It's great. It's really great. And I think the question is, um, you know, why haven't the Palestinians, rather than rejecting the Abraham Accords outright, rather than taking the position that their needs need to be taken care of first before any other Arab country normalizes ties with Israel, why not give it a chance? 
why not? Uh, why aren't the Palestinian uh, leaders in the West Bank um, wanting to join the Abraham Accords? Uh, my uh, my question to any Palestinian leader would be: Look, we all want you at some point um, to 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 be independent, to have statehood in the West Bank. On day one, on the first day of Palestinian statehood, you need to have a functioning economy. You need a functioning economy. And what better way to build up a functioning economy than by joining the Abraham Accords right now? Forget BDS. It's not helping to create a functioning Palestinian economy. Join the Abraham Accords. You have nothing to lose. The purpose of the Abraham Accords is not to deny your statehood. The purpose of the Abraham Accords is to, is to create the economic conditions in the West Bank for a successful state, uh, just as um, the Jewish agency and the Yishuv did during the 1920s and the 1930s, laying the economic groundwork for the successful launch on day one of a state, the state of Israel, that immediately came under attack military attack from all of its neighbors. Um, so uh, that would be my sincere, uh, really sincere, it's not meant to be sarcastic or condescending, it is a sincere question to the Palestinian uh, leadership. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll agree that we've uh, had a, a fascinating discussion of the League of Nations mandate for Palestine and the uh, related history properly reflecting the importance of this recognition by the international community of the right of the Jewish people to their national home in the land of Israel. Steve, thank you so much for yet another superb webinar. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've not charged for the webinar, but we would encourage you to make a voluntary donation to support our work. And we look forward to your joining us again in future webinars. Thank you all. Thank you very much, everyone.